community engagement. And what I wanted to, I guess the idea from this came, uh, personally, my husband here, Leroy Abraham, is very much involved in the community in different ways and has a history of being involved in the community. And I always thought, we as medical professionals, we don't really know how to engage the community. That's not something we learn in medical school. It's not something we're taught in residency. And so I wanted to uh, create a, hopefully a robust discussion about how we as physicians can be engaged in our community, whether it's here in Birmingham or wherever we may go for residency or for clinical practice. And so um, I'll start by introducing the panel just by their names and I'll allow them to go more in depth about um, what they do and in what ways they've engaged the community and then we'll get into some questions. So as I mentioned, this is my husband, Leroy Abrahams. He's wonderful. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> he currently uh, works at Regions and I'll, I'll let him describe a little bit about what he does. He's J.W. Carpenter, um, president over the Ed Birmingham Foundation, Anthony Hood, um, as you guys have, um, I think met in some capacity before. I know you came to UAB once or twice before to do a talk about branding yourself. Um, but he'll talk more about what he does. And this is my father-in-law, Leroy Abrahams first, uh, who also works at Regions Point. So um, Leroy, why don't you go ahead and start and just describe yourself, what you do, and your prior engagement in the community in the past. Okay, so um, Leroy Abrahams, and uh, my work at Regions Bank as a, a quality manager, so we have a payment processing business, so I manage a group there. Um, I've, been, I've been in Birmingham for going on five years now, and um, it's been a great five years, and um, a large part of that is just due to um, the gentleman sitting beside me, um, um, included my dad, but um, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, he's <laughs> But <laughs> Dr. Hood, J.W. Carpenter, they've been very instrumental to um, get, getting me acquainted with the community. I, you know, I grew up in many locations throughout the South and whatnot, so I didn't have any connections to the area, of any, uh, much like many of you. But um, after meeting them, they plugged me into a number of organizations um, that they are affiliated with. And I got to be involved with uh, an organization called Jones Valley Teaching Farms, and from there that allowed me to be involved with opportunities with um, at Birmingham um, and um, there's an organization called Workshops Inc. Um, that helps individuals with disabilities get jobs in the community and so I was able to meet them and um, currently um, I'm serving as a school board chair with my, my local church um, at the Sister Academy and so there's a lot of opportunities that I've been able to have um, to, to be involved in the community even though i am continuing to, to grow my career. Uh, so what's cool is uh, former junior board member, board uh, secretary, former board member. So I just feel really good, like to have this kind of talent in in, uh, in my world. Um, so I'm the executive director of the Education Foundation for Birmingham. Um, our mission is just increase the number of kids who are graduating college career life ready. Uh, first and foremost, we should be super proud of this institution. I nicknamed UAB the Department of Yes because in six and a half years of asking, I've never gotten it. And so we are doing uh, career access, we're doing college access, executive skill building, and then essentially just building a diverse network of folks who are gonna work together, leverage your talent to expand opportunities for the kids. Kids in state schools, limitless potential, but often uh, not as many opportunities as certainly they deserve and certainly to match their potential. So that plays out in a lot of different ways. Here, uh, at some point, I think probably, uh, every day between now and the end of June, there's at least one and up to 10 Birmingham City Schools kids doing internships, paid internships. The other day we had kids out here just looking at the college. What is the college? Not necessarily to go to UAD, but what is college? They're doing site business in eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, because kids know 10 jobs, you know? And, they get, and, and so we want them to know all the different types of jobs that are out there, because we think kids should order off the whole menu. And so we've got that piece of it. That's how UAB is playing a role, but we're doing that in industries all across the city. We serve about 4,000 students, and we now have a new alumni program as well, where students who graduate, who have been part of our group uh, for, for sometimes up to six years, can get up to five years of support after they graduate high school, no matter what they're doing. Because it turns out, guys, I'm gonna blow you away here, your problems don't stop at 18. And so we wanna make sure we're bending that curve because the data we're seeing is stark. Only one out of six graduates of the city schools are gonna get a degree within six years. So a two or four year degree. 
If I met one out of six kids and felt like, yeah, that's about who should get a degree, I wouldn't be so mad all the time. And we've got to bend that number and bend that curve. It's a moral thing to do, it's a strategic thing to do. We also do some big picture thinking around policy work, school analysis, working on our educator workforce and deep community engagement. Um, and then lastly, I'd say I'm also the president this year of the Hispanic Interest Coalitions Board, uh, and I'm on the board of A-plus Education Partnership. So I run a nonprofit, but also see it from the board uh, angle as well. Thank you. Good morning, or afternoon, ma'am. Uh, my name is Anthony Hood. Uh, I've been at UAB for nine years. Uh, so my primary appointment is in the school of business. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship and strategy. Um, I got promotion and tenure in 2017, and then uh, the next year after that, I took on a new appointment where I work in the president's office. So in the president's office, I support UAB's strategic uh, plan, Forging the Future, with a particular emphasis on the community engagement and economic development pillars of the UAB strategic plan. So what does that look like? It looks like UAB developing partnerships that have an impact both statewide, but with a particular focus on the greater Birmingham area. So it's partnering with organizations like the Birmingham Education Foundation, looking at the pipeline of students that are going to be coming through our K-12 system that are, will ultimately funnel into UAB and making sure we're a good partner there. Also making sure that we're engaged in the workforce um, because we are constantly recruiting top-notch faculty, staff, physicians, folks just like you to come to UAB either as medical students or as faculty members. Uh, a lot of you are going to have trailing spouses and families, and so the difference between you coming here or to UC San Diego or to Emory oftentimes comes down to the community. Where am I going to live? Where, where am I going to buy a house? Where are my kids going to go to school? How's the school system? All those things have a role to play in how successful we're going to be in recruiting and retaining top-notch talent. So we recognize that we have this UAB is also the largest employer in the state of Alabama. We have about 24,000 employees and over 23,000 students. So with that comes a lot of responsibility to be engaged in a lot of different facets that make uh, a community uh, thriving. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Birmingham. My mom was actually a nurse here at UAB. She worked in uh, transplant in Southern Northwest. So she came here in 1966 when the first wave of African-American nurses and stuff started coming to UAB. She actually preceded UAB. UAB didn't even become UAB until 1969. Prior to that, it was just university hospital. So she saw a lot of transition. So I kind of grew up in and around this place. Also, I went to high school at Ramsey High School, which is just a couple blocks up the street. It's a Birmingham City School. I feel like I got a really great uh, education here in the school system. And I want to make sure that all kids in Birmingham have a good experience. And so that's one of the things that drew me to the Birmingham Education Foundation. And we'll kind of talk about that. I started with just being a volunteer. I volunteer with some of the programming at the foundation. I also, because I teach entrepreneurship, uh, the Education Foundation were considering developing an app uh, that connected parents uh, with the schools and with their kids. And so JW asked if some of my students to work on developing a feasibility analysis for this piece of software that they had developed. So my students worked on that. They gave me another exposure to the organization. And I guess at some time after that, JW asked me to be a board member. You'll find that JW is very persuasive <laughs> in getting uh, board members. Uh, this gentleman next to me, I also serve on another board with him, uh, the Woodland Foundation, which he may speak about that. So we'll talk about you know the role that we may play in getting on junior boards, YP boards, and then ultimately some of the larger nonprofit boards in the city. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Leroy Abraham, it's the original. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm proud of the, uh, I'm proud of two, he's actually uh, better looking and smarter. So that's <laughs> um, I work for regions, my responsibility is I'm head of community affairs. And so community affairs for regions includes um, something, one part that's kind of technical that we won't get into, but something called the Community Reinvestment Act that deals with how we, um, how, how we make our services available and serve the low and moderate income areas of the, of the communities that we, that we're in. Um, we've got a community relations team, we also have a Regents Foundation, um, and then we have um, a small group that does outreach to organizations that deal with individuals with disabilities, and also uh, veterans and, and service members. So 
kind of wraps up a, a bundle of things. Our, our philosophy is, uh, as a bank, is that we're only going to be as strong as the communities that we serve. Um, so our investment in these communities, really, we see that as, as beneficial to the organization overall. We're the second largest employer in town with about 6,000. Um, and so really between, and we're very, very grateful for UAB, because I tell you, between UAB uh, and regions, we really feel like these organizations need to work well together to help drive what happens in town, and UAB is a huge driver. You know, with 50,000 or so people directly either in school or working for UAB, and then the economic impact of all that goes on around it, um, Birmingham doesn't really get much done unless UAB is, is, is helping move that forward. In terms of my personal involvement, um, uh, several years ago, um, uh, I was the area president in our market, and I remember asking my, my boss at the time, so in terms of our community involvement, what does that mean? What percentage of my time should I think about dedicating to community activities? And he said, that's got to be at least 25 to 33% of the job which shocked me that as an organization, we would allow um, that kind of involvement, that kind of commitment, and, and to really endorse that as, as part of the job. But again, it just reinforces what I said earlier, that we truly believe that in order to serve the community well, in order to grow as a bank, we've got to participate in that. We've got to help, uh, we've got to help the, the communities grow. One of the things that we've done over the past couple of years is that we've stepped back and we realized that we were essentially trying to be all things to all people. And it's great to have a number of organizations say, hey, we really appreciate the support. But at the end of the day, it was tough for us to step back and see, well, how did we move the dial on any particular issue? What could we say that we actually did because we've just kind of spread our support across so many areas? So we came up with really three strategic priorities for our philanthropy and our community engagement. And the first one is economic and community development. Again, that falls into the category of as you grow the, your community, it, it enables you to better grow the bank. And why is that important? Because the more we grow, the more we can plow back into the community. So it's got a, there's a sustainability aspect to all of the, uh, the priorities we've chosen. The second one is education and workforce readiness. Frequently, you know, in my job, I, I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of business owners. And more times than not, they said the greatest impediment to their growth was not access to capital, but it was really access to people. So when you think about um, folks coming out of our schools that are, that are workforce ready, that are, that are college ready, that impacts our ability to grow the economy. And, and so that's a big deal for, for us. The third one is financial literacy because we think the financial system works better when everybody's educated, whether they're our customer or not. And um, so those things are, um, they're authentic to who we are as an organization, but they're also, we think, very important to the community. And that's what we've been trying to focus more on and, and do a better job of measuring results so we know where to, continue to, where to continue investing and where to maybe pull back and be able to retarget some of our funds. It has been my pleasure in the seven years that I've been in the market, one of the first boards I, I had the opportunity to join was JW's, was the uh, Birmingham Ed. And I would tell you that between these two gentlemen, JW Carpenter, Dr. Anthony Hood, there are probably no two more well-connected people. That probably didn't sound right. I'm glad you all are <laughs> English majors. But these two guys are probably the best two connected guys that I know. I, you, could, you can't meet you can't meet three people without two of them knowing one of them or maybe both of them. So um, uh, they're, I don't know about me, but these two are great to have on the panel. I'll just endorse them. <laughs> Everybody knows him because he controls my okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm under no illusion that it's my uh, winning personality. <laughs> it's about the fact that I work for the biggest bank in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> very generous good bank. <laughs> Well, speaking, of, speaking of which, I, I would love for you to mention life since uh, you know, oh, talking about your yeah, career. Yeah. So one of the things we did, um, going back probably three or four years ago, uh, UAB had um, a major campaign um, that we were asked to participate in, and we thought, well, if we're going to do this, how, how do we do it in a way that's really authentic to us? Not, the, not that we don't love the medical school, but we realize banking, medicine, there's just not a, an immediate tie 
although it's extremely important. So we said what we wanted to do was maybe have the Regents Institute for Financial Education, which is our way of saying how can we invest in the financial education of the community as well as all of UAB students to the extent possible. So it's in the School of Business. And there, there's, we've got an institute that we're extremely proud of. So thank you for letting me bring that up. We've got a tenured professor, uh, Stephanie Yates, uh, who does some tremendous research um, throughout the state of Alabama on, on really key issues around financial education. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a matter of pride for us. So thanks for remembering that. Well, thank you all for sharing. It was, um, you guys did more than I thought you did. <laughs> Very impressive resume. Um, so I want to start off with a question. As I mentioned before, we all know that community engagement is very important. If someone asks you, should you be engaged in your community, we'll automatically say yes. But I think it's really important to tease out why exactly is that important and, and how is it important. So I was wondering if you guys could share with me what prompted you or motivated you to be engaged in the community here in Birmingham and what way in what way has it benefited you of course in career advancement networking personal fulfillment work-life balance and any in any other way it may have benefited you in your life um, and we can start at the end here um, so for, for me I guess the way I look at life is there is there are, there are different categories if you will where you know you um, focus on you know doing what you have to do you know to, to, to pay your bills to grow your career but another aspect of life is what am I doing to make the lives of others around me better and um, I believe I do that on my job um, but at the same time there is a hunger to do that um, for for the community more directly um, and so I think that's always been a major area of interest for me and I've always sought to to fill that need and so being and working at, at regions and whatnot kind of provides me kind of with you know the foundation to um, work with a bank that's, that's known in the community but that also leads to opportunities to get involved with with organizations and to it's, it's kind of an entryway to show that hey you know there's something I could I could bring to the table and once I'm there it provides an opportunity to really make a make an impact. Um, I'll blame the Jesuits. I went to Boston College <laughs> and the priests more or less were like uh, just so you know this isn't for you we're gonna give you four years we're gonna you know tell you everything we know uh, but when you're done you're gonna go out there and do something about it. And so they they hit you pretty hard with that the whole time. And I bought in, and I'll tell you up till then, I really hadn't bought in. I was uh, pretty much in the JW Carpenter industry, and uh, it was going well. Uh, but, but Boston College, they said, just go out there and do something. After that, uh, I did Teach for America. I taught uh, up to one, up to two, trigonometry, calculus, and English. Welcome to teaching at a rural school. Uh, and you did what was asked of you. Um, and I think over the course of that in engagement, um, it, what I realized was how much immense privilege I had. Six foot tall, straight white male, high income background. It's, it's damn hard to screw that up. And meanwhile, I'm teaching kids who the major difference between me and them is not ability, it's just margin for error. Mine is huge and theirs is so thin. And what I, now I'm on the other end is I got a little six and a four year old. And it's like, well, what do I, where do I want, what, what do I want them to grow up in? In what world do I want them to grow up in? And what we have in Birmingham is on one hand, the one of the most generous communities in time and money, civically engaged, it's weird not to be involved, but one that is very fractured and divided, where people can have an extraordinarily good life and not interact with uh, anyone that doesn't look like them, that doesn't share their background. And sometimes it doesn't feel like we're always in this one together. And to me, that is immoral. It's just not how I want to live my life. And it, but it's also just existentially, we will just die as a city. So whatever gets you there, I don't care if it's moral or strategic. I think both are true. I believe our work's at that. I, I believe that work is at that intersection. But it's like you can wall yourself off for only so long before it just all collapses and falls apart. And I think that we, the work that we do at Ed, like you know the 
best chance we've got at talent right now are, I mean, are the kids in the city schools. That's our pipeline. They've been here since God was a boy. They want to be here in Birmingham. And it's like, and right now our output doesn't match their talent. So how, so what I, the reason I want to get engaged is just from a personal view, I want this to be the world that I live in and the world that the kids live in. But I like Birmingham, I just don't want to move again. It's a pain to move. And, I, and it, if we don't fix it and we don't get everyone engaged and involved, we're gonna to have to move, we're gonna to have to leave. And, and so that is an urgency. I'll say the other thing too is I'm an Irish guy, I'm pretty mad, I'm pretty angry. <laughs> we're, we're born angry as the Irish. And like, so I got two choices, either I'm walking around with a baseball bat just smashing windows, or I direct that anger towards something productive, and direct that rage towards uh, flipping the inequities that just a bunch of really talented kids and families uh, face. I haven't seen this angry party before. <laughs> well, that's because I always get my funding request. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, for, for me, I, you know, my mom was a nurse. My dad worked uh, in U.S. Field, and I uh, spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And my grandparents always went to what we call civic league meetings, but it's now the neighborhood association meetings. And it was just normal. So I, I grew up in a very small little neighborhood called Wyla on the other side of Kinsley. And uh, it was just very communal. Everybody knew each other. Everybody pitched in and helped each other out. And that was just normal to me. And so I, I think once I grew up and became an adult, I, you know, I just sought out opportunities to serve. Before I went to academia, I was an engineer for 10 years. I worked at um, Bell South and AT&T. And so, we had these employee affinity groups. So I was always a part of these employee affinity groups that were going out, read to kids, do school cleanups and things like that. And you know, through those opportunities, I did those because I felt like it was the right thing to do. It felt very socially responsible, but it was also just a way for me to stay engaged with my local community. But I think the benefits from that when when I did that, you know, a lot of times you go to your affinity group meetings and next thing you know, your area vice president is in there. The, the Leroy Abrahams are in those meetings, or CEO might just drop by or invite you to lunch. And so I find I find that through serving at work gives you access to people within your organization that you would not normally uh, meet, as well as people in the community. And then also people who you are serving alongside that are in different parts of the organization that normally your, your, your paths would not cross because you're so focused in, in your silos. And um, I think coming to UAB, I think a lot of that translated. Now I think for those of us who are in medicine or academic medicine, you know, most of our jobs are based on research, teaching, and service, or some combination of those three. And so I kind of see my career as like these three concentric circles. So I do research on collaboration, I teach these courses in business, and service is, for, for me, it's service in the community. And so I'm always thinking about how can I get those three circles to overlap? such that when I'm doing my research, it's community-based participatory research. When I'm teaching, I'm always looking for opportunities to take my students outside of the classroom, take them off the UAB's campus, just like last week we went over to the Woodlawn Foundation. The week before last, I took them to Innovation Depot so that I can actually see startup companies in action. JW usually comes to uh, my class at least once a semester and talks to my students about the work that they're doing with the Education Foundation. So I'm always looking at how can I do one thing, but it can hit three different areas. And that's one of the things that I want to encourage you is, in your normal everyday work, how can you do it in such a way where you invite the community into your work, or you take your work out into the community so you're touching on a couple of things at the same time? I think for me, I don't know where it started, but there's been a desire to, to, to get back and feel like you're contributing something. Uh, I do remember my senior year of college, uh, I was finishing up a finance degree, and it hit me. I thought, okay, I'm going to go to work for I'm really glad I've got a job, but what am I going to do? I'm just going to like go make money and then not do anything. And it just, it was this um, almost like a crisis moment of, is this all my life is going to be? And I thought, and I had to go through a process of understanding that, you know, in, in, in banking, there's ways to, to be of service and there's good that comes from that. And when I was thinking about you all, actually I got really excited because I thought, I can't think of another profession that just seems to just 
naturally lend itself to people wanting to help. I mean, I, I've never run in, well, maybe never is a strong word, but I, I would rarely run into a physician that I think didn't at least start out with the idea of I'm doing this because I want to help people. So I think it's kind of innate. It's, I mean, it's natural. You wouldn't be where you are if you didn't want to do this. I, um, what I'd like you to think about if you, if you haven't already, though, is the, the importance of you being involved, right? And it's not only about you know what you what you learn and what you, what you bring from the you know, from a professional standpoint, because you may not want to do something that's that's medically related when you're doing volunteering or when you're, but the the thought process, how you're trained to think through a problem, um, how you're trained to to ask questions, to to get to uh, to understand the problem, and then to to have a way of okay, how do we deal with this issue? How do you how do you work with people? You'd be surprised at how much of a need there is for that in, in a lot of nonprofit organizations where if you're sitting on a junior board or you're sitting on the board and you can bring that perspective to the table, it would be extremely valuable because not, not everyone there has that. So just something to think about. Cool. I'm trying to refrain from saying dad. Um, <laughs> dad, I can you at least start by um, maybe talking a little bit about what is sort of the landscape in Birmingham uh, for philanthropic efforts? Because I think as physicians, you know, we know a little bit that there's probably lots of nonprofit organizations like in Birmingham, and we know that big businesses like UAB and Regions are often supporting or sponsoring different events in the community, but we, know, we don't know exactly what are the many options that we can get involved. Yeah. Yeah, I can start, and I, again, I, I think the panel was a pretty good panel, so um, if, if you want to think about arts and education or arts and culture, I mean, that's huge. So whether it's the theater, there's, um, uh, there, there's several of those groups, whether it's Red Mountain Theater, uh, Virginia Sanford Theater, um, so we've got folks that are interested in, in performing arts. Um, there's obviously education opportunities to, to be involved with. Um, I would say, I would say call United Way is a good place and say I'm interested in volunteering and you can go online and see the list of organizations that they support. The benefit of that is that United Way is almost, a, I think of that as like a clearinghouse. If, if you want to work with an organization that you know has, has been vetted and uh, they're being held accountable, United Way is a great place to start because any, any organization that they support uh, believe me, they're, they're going through a pretty rigorous process of reporting their results and, um, and, and being able to demonstrate some effectiveness. Uh, but boy, there's just, there's a whole gamut. You know, um, Dr. Hood talked about an organization we were on together called uh, Woodlawn Foundation. That's a, that's a little bit unique, but this is, this is a place-based uh, nonprofit where instead of tackling one broad issue, across or one one narrow issue across a broad area they've tackled three or four uh, issues deeply in one small area to take the woodlawn community they basically said if woodlawn is going to come back alive and grow and prosper we've got to tackle education we've got to tackle workforce we've got to tackle um, housing and we have to do it together and and i think about your profession so much of what you probably end up seeing that manifests itself in poor health outcomes really is based on economic drivers, based on education drivers. You see these strong correlations and having people like you at the table, uh, you just you bring a perspective where you get to see the results of what happens when Woodlawn doesn't work well or when the education system doesn't work well and, and be able to give that kind of input and help in that decision making. I think it's pretty powerful. So I think I strayed from your question. So I was gonna wanna pose a kind of question still on the topic here. Can you describe for us the differences between a junior board versus a senior board versus sort of a nonprofit organization versus a for profit organization such as regions who has a lot of community engagement? So I think these are terms that you guys use pretty regularly and freely in your world and I don't know about you guys, it seems foreign to me. I don't know the difference really between both of them. Um, could you break it down for us just a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, it, 
ultimately the, the role of a board with the support of directors or board of trustees or advisory board, their role is to assist the leadership of the organization in their strategic planning, to hold the leader accountable for carrying out the mission of the organization. That's the worst part. <laughs> <laughs> and, accountability. And just, yeah, accountability, you know, and support. Uh, oftentimes in a nonprofit setting, a lot of it comes down to fundraising. Um, and so we help make sure that there are resources available uh, for the organization. And while we may help mobilize financial resources, we're also using our social capital to make sure that the organization is connected to people, you know, or places or what have you in the community. So those are some of the nuances between the nonprofit board versus Regions Inc. Uh, has a for-profit board that, you know, typically has a lot of their peers, CEOs, and other executives that might sit on that board. But like JW mentioned, this community has a plethora of nonprofit boards that are always seeking uh, new board members. Now, oftentimes to be on the nonprofit board, you need to have some experience of being a board member because it is a responsibility. Um, because you go through the financials of the organization, you make sure that they're spending money the way they need to spend money, all those kind of things. So how do you get that experience? And oftentimes you get that experience by serving on a junior board of one of these organizations. Sometimes it's a junior board, sometimes it's called a young professionals board, um, but I think getting your teeth cut with some of those types of entities will give you the experience necessary to be an effective board member at what we would call the senior board level, senior level. Since we were up, up for this question to you, um, having recently served as the president of the Workshop Inc. Uh, junior board, um, when you were a young lad trying to get involved in community engagement or community in some way. How did you go about putting your name out there? Did you start showing up at events? Did you email someone? How did you sort of work your way up to being the president of this junior board? I think the big thing is just showing a willingness to get involved. And so if you start out by, um, as Scott earlier was saying, you know, going to an organization like United Way, just looking at opportunities and um, talking to those of us on the panel um, after this is done. I mean, any oper any area of interest that you have, for me, it's always been, I've had a strong interest in economic development and education, so I really started there. And so, um, it's kind of how I met um, J.W. Carpenter, that was the organization I worked with when I first came into Birmingham, and so just kind of showing an interest in those things leads to people, you know, inviting you out to events, you get to meet, um, executive directors, you meet the development directors, and you know, they say, hey, you know, you have a junior board, you like to be on it. Or you can even ask, hey, is there a junior board? How can I get involved? That's the, the best question to ask. And if they have a junior board, most likely their response will be, hey, we would love for you to be on our junior board. <laughs> Trust me, because there's, there's not enough young professionals like ourselves getting involved with junior boards. And so um, just asking being involved there once you're on, um, it's generally, um, you're it's not a demanding thing at all. So if you're thinking, hey, this is gonna be like another job, it's not, it's really a great space to um, spend usually like an hour to five a month um, getting to know some people that may not all be in your field and getting exposure to leaders from other nonprofit organizations, leaders in um, the private sector. And so it's a really great place great way to get to know the community, get to know people, build new connections, build new relationships. And generally, as you work on the, on the board, you know, you're planning an event. And so, for example, when I was um, with Workshop Sync, we used to, we, we, do a, we did an event called um, Cornhole. I did not realize that Cornhole was such an intense sport until I came to Alabama. And there's apparently there's a tournament. It's a whole sport. I met the Cornhole champion um, at Cahaba Brewery. And so we every year we. <laughs> so yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, one year Dr. Hood was the glorious MC for the for Cornhole Cup tournament. Um, Think of the opportunities that await you. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and so every year we planned this event at Cobb Brewery where you know people would get tickets, we would raffle off um, different prizes and whatnot, and we would set up 19 pairs of cornhole boards, and there would be a, a social tournament, and there would be the competitive tournament, and um, it, was, it was a fun event. There would be about five to ten of us on the board, we would plan the event, 
raise about 10 to 15,000 for, for the organization. And um, it was, you know, something that really challenged us to leverage the contacts we have in the community to kind of step out of our comfort zone a little bit, meet some new people and have a good time. And so um, it's really just being willing to say yes, being willing to get involved and um, those opportunities will just arise. I want to add something. Um, so once you start getting involved in the community and people start knowing who you are, you will be asked to be on a lot of boards. Um, and you might feel compelled to say yes to all of them. What I found is that it's, it's important to understand where your purpose and your passion is. Right. And because I see all the time where people will commit and say, yeah, I'll join the board, but they don't know a lot about the organization or its mission and they get into it and now it feels like work. Whereas when I work with the Education Foundation, it doesn't feel like work, other than I work for JW, but it doesn't feel like work <laughs> because I'm passionate about education. I have two daughters, they're in fourth and sixth grade in Birmingham. So I know that what I'm doing with the Education Foundation is ultimately gonna have an impact on them as well as kids just like them. Housing is another thing that's really important to me. So that's why I love the work of the Woodlawn Foundation, that's why I joined the Housing Authority of the Birmingham District. But all those organizations, I started by volunteering with the organization first, finding out what they're about, what the people are about, what the mission is about, and then I can make an informed decision as to what I'm gonna commit. Because the worst thing you do is commit to something and right. don't follow through. Yeah, and, and I would just say, pick one thing. Just one thing to start, this is life dating. You know, <laughs> you don't wanna just have coffee and say, let's go. <laughs> right? you know, and it's like, don't do that. You know, you wanna do a little bit uh, of, of that piece of it. And just understand, like, there are a lot of people doing really, really good work in this community. What I would say is anyone who wants to talk to me, I'm happy to spend 15, 20 minutes talking to you all and help you navigate this world. United Way is a great place to start, but, you know, some of these nonprofits are, are doing good work, but, but some of them are not because they're bad people, just the inherency, the inherently in the nonprofit, like, we're an inefficient entity. Like, we can't be killed by market forces. Uh, we can live off sentimentality for years. And so something just is, exists because it's existed for 40 years. And so one of the things that's really important to me, both as an executive director, but now as board chair of HECA, is I, keep, I make sure that nobody's time is wasted. And so like, what are the expectations? What is happening at the meeting? Do you understand the impact? Are you responsive to feed, like, is the organization responsive to your feedback and getting information? So as you get engaged in this, and you'll see it from a volunteer perspective, like, is this organization really gonna value your time? Because, I mean, listen, y'all are doctors, your time is not your own. I don't even understand how you become a doctor. Like, all my friends are doctors, and I feel like I'm gonna be at their funeral in 40 years, and I almost made it, you know? Because it's just like, there doesn't, it just seems like it takes forever. Uh, it's so expensive, and you guys are already doing service, and so I just recognize that, like, your time is extraordinarily valuable, So but it's also your expertise and your knowledge and the different things that you have experienced and learned in your personal life and professional life would be so valuable for this community. And as you guys are looking to go out in the nonprofit community, I feel really lucky because I found my way in to you, to UAB and UAB Hospital. And we do so much with UAB Hospital because I know Wilfred Hanning. And then boom, now I got 10 kids doing paid internships. You know, that's game changing for kids. And so there are plenty of folks who want to engage with you as, you know, like looking at a bear. You both are afraid and you both want to get it, you know, figure this situation out. Like, so there are a lot of folks that want to engage with you too. And I think I'll, be, I'll pose the last question to you then open mm -hmm. it up to the group and our time left. Um, a lot of times we as physicians, we think when we are engaged in the community, either in a junior board or part of a nonprofit organization in some way, the main thing we're expected to do is some sort of health talk or mm -hmm. um, plan some sort of community health fair, which are all great things. But when I, as a physician, send you that email, shake your hand, meet you for the first time, and I tell you that I work at UAB as a, as a, as a medical doctor, what do you envision me actually doing in your organization? Is it only health-related stuff, or are there other things that you think that I can do? I have no idea. And so when you have the meeting with someone, like obviously if you're a doctor, it's like, well, I'm gonna, you, you, I, I'm gonna assume some things about your knowledge base. But if you're meeting with someone in a nonprofit or engaged, and, and they don't ask you a bunch of questions about who you are, run, run. Most folks don't, 
you know? I ask a lot of questions of a lot of people, probably a little intrusive sometimes. <laughs> but my wager is, this is just based on my lived experience and data I read, I bet a lot of y'all play an instrument. I bet a lot of y'all play an instrument. That's incredibly valuable. That's incredibly valuable, you know, to some of our kids and engaging with them. I have no idea what your backgrounds are. I have no idea what your skills are. I have no idea what you're interested in. You may come in and say, I'm super passionate about making sure that people who want to be doctors know what a doctor is and, and know what this is, great. At the end, we call it following your natural energy. You may say, I'm pretty medicine now. You know, I really, I played sports in, in, in high school. Is there a place I could just like coach a couple days a week or something like that? You know, it, it, I have no idea, like I, I love to read. Or I, like, I mean, the, presumably y'all have other interests. And so I don't know what that is. Uh, I have no idea what that is until I talk to you and figure out what your strengths are, where are the strengths in the community, where do they, how do we put this together in a smart way? And, and so that's how I would approach it and when I'm at my best, which is not always. Um, and, and so I think that's what your expectation should be of any way that you get involved is just to, to follow your passion, follow the energy, and work with people who want to actually know who the heck you are and don't just assume because you're wearing a white coat you want to do a certain thing. Can, can I add something? So, so that said, I, I wrote a list of different mechanisms here at UAB that if you don't know about, I would encourage you, and I'll make sure I'll, I'll email this out to you. You know, we talked about Forge in the Future, which is UAB strategic plan. And about a year or two ago, with this campus-wide uh, planning process around what we call the UAB Grand Challenge. And so Dr. Mona Fouad's, uh, project was selected for UAB Grand Challenge. She runs the UAB Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Center. This is a huge deal. This is something that UAB is putting at least $3 million behind, making sure that we take the state of Alabama from being number 49th in health outcomes, thank God for Mississippi, to take those from 49th to get out of the 40s to at least number 39 in the next several years. And so this is gonna be very community engaged. We're gonna be tackling things like physical activity, nutrition, as well as the built environment. So there will be plenty of opportunities to participate in the UAB Grand Challenge, and that's gonna take you out into the community. Um, I mentioned the UAB MHRC. They have a young professional board. I used to serve on that young professional board. Yeah. And, I, and so you get a chance to meet people, not only all across UAB, but all across the city. Mm -hmm. All kinds of people inside and outside of healthcare that serve on that young professional board. We do this uh, Casino Royale fundraiser every year. We have the casino style games. It's always a big, a big huge shit. You have never experienced anything than being yelled at as a blackjack dealer by some guy who's drunk and playing for not real money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're familiar with the UAB CCTS, the Center for Clinical and Translational Science, they have what's called One Great Community, which is another community outreach uh, mechanism. They have a uh, community Health Innovation Award program where it's like a pitch competition for people who have ideas to address health related things. So. Uh, you can get money and, and engage there. We have a community engagement institute that the CCTS puts on each year. So I will email these out, but there's so many mechanisms through UAB mm -hmm. that is a very easy on-ramp into the community so, you, you, so that you can see what you might want to spend even more time on. Thank you. Um, any questions for uh, the So I would say like that's what we're trying to do with our programming. So uh, at each high school in Birmingham, there are seven, there's at least one and up to three career academies. These are essentially schools within schools where you're still doing the academics, but you also do some career-based uh, work uh, along a specific theme. And three of those academies are health science academies. So what we're doing in working with the teachers, nothing we do is possible without great educators in these city schools, do not think otherwise, um, is beginning as young as eighth grade we are taking students out to learn what is out there. You know, so eighth through 10th grade is really just getting as much information to them and meeting as many different professionals as possible. And UAB is a major partner there. Not the only one, but a major partner there, just so they can learn what's going on. 11th grade, that becomes job shadowing. And then 12th grade becomes the paid internship piece where they interview and do a paid internship. 10 are here, but we have some others that like, 
had uh, you know physical therapy. Uh, the, the, a lot of people do physical therapy. There are individual doctors and who are involved, uh, and and so that piece is is part of the work that we're doing. We could always do more, uh, and we're also layering that on skill building and college access. So if you're in two weeks, you'll if you're at the Batwell Auditorium, you'll see 400 eighth graders doing elevator pitches. You know, uh, if you had been at the club. Uh, last November, you said 411th and 12th graders, resume writing, public speaking, mock interviews with the largest Rotary Club in the world. So we're doing that skill building piece, and then when they enter into whatever it is they're doing, in this case, it'd be a two or a four year school if they're entering into the medical profession, we are now offering support as they're going, as they're entering into that piece. Support is a very broad term. We're 18 months in, we're doing more learning than executing here, but we paid for summer classes, we've helped them with financial aid, we've helped them with scholarships, We've helped them with tutoring, you know, like we're helping now get kids connected with different internships and just also sitting down and saying, hey, I've got my two-year degree. Do I want to do nursing now or do I want to go to a four-year degree or maybe I don't want to be a doctor. What do I do now? And so that piece is where I think a lot of our kids need. And so we're engaged with that work. Uh, there's always more to do and there are other people in this community who are doing really good work. Does that answer your question? Not really. Okay. Sure. Wonderful information about the program, but since I'm not in Birmingham and I don't live in Birmingham, right. I can't work with your program. So, what can I do on a smaller level to have a similar, maybe on a lesser scale, impact? Well, show up. Where? People need to see a doctor. They go where young people are. A lot, oftentimes at school. Um, reach out to a local school and say, hey, do you have a group of students that I can come and just kind of tell them? Hey, I'm a doctor, and this is what I do. So they actually, actually see me. Only doctor I saw was my primary care doctor when I was in high school. I became an engineer, but I never saw an engineer until I went off to college. Um, there are a lot of students that may not even be thinking about college right now, and they're not great. So just letting them see you just means more. And I got three people all in addition to the Nashville little paper. I'll speak a little bit on, on that. Just a couple years ago, the diversity enrichment committee that we're a part of here in the trauma medicine program, we went to a local uh, middle school and um, was granted a little time, about 45 minutes to speak with the, medical, the middle school students about health. And um, we did a theme on uh, create a restaurant with a healthy menu. And they loved it, it was great. We had all types of, all types of restaurant names and, and ideas. And by the end of it, they learned, we talked a little bit about health principles, and they also, most of them had never really seen a doctor outside of, as you mentioned, their own primary doctor. They wanted our autographs. That's, that's how much, that's how important it was to them. Um, so just showing up, coming up with a simple idea, something that any one of us can do in the room, um, just to promote that this is a possibility for you. One, one thing I would add real quick is, um, so my current role, um, school board chair at local Ephesus Academy, a lot of the students that go there, you know, they would love, you know, if, you know, someone volunteered to tutor them in math. And so we were talking about some of the things that JW would assume um, meeting you as a doctor. So the assumptions I would have is like, you probably are pretty good with science. You're probably really good with math. Um, you know, some basic assumptions. Those things happen to be major. Um, yeah, yeah. So those things happen to be major elements of focus in our in our school system. And so if you could come in and help a kid, you know, solve an algebra problem, or you know, help someone do a science experiment or something, and then just in passing, they ask, "Hey, what do you do? You mentioned you're a doctor. That could be a major game changer for them." And so again, it's not, you know going in and, and doing a, a lab or doing a health fair or something, it's doing it, going in, pursuing your interest. Maybe you like to play sports, maybe you like to teach on the side, just pursuing that interest, but at the same time being a mentor and using your career to inspire someone to, to get where you are currently. I would be remiss not to mention Blazer Pulse. Have you guys heard of Blazer Pulse? So Blazer Pulse is UAB's platform, uh, it's kind of like a job board but for service related activities. So the Birmingham Education Foundation has their own account. Whenever they are looking for volunteers, they will be doing engagement. They can post that on Blazor Pulse. Anybody within the UAB system or even outside the UAB system can see that, respond to it, say, hey, I'd like to volunteer for. One of the things that we're doing right now at UAB is helping students fill out the FAFSA. You know, so again, just, and it's 
You don't have to be an expert and have to fill out the financial aid form, but just actually sitting down with the student and say, okay, put your social security number here, you do this, that, it means the world of difference because ACT prep, SAT prep, FAFSA, if you're not doing those things, it's gonna be very hard for you to get to college. If you go to college, you can't go to public school. With that being said, we're out of time, but I want to thank our wonderful panel. Once again, let's give a round of applause. to just uh, make a mention of Dr. Linda Fell joining us, our Department of Medicine Chair. We appreciate you taking the time to come out to be with us, as well as Dr. Willen and Dr. Morris, our Program Associate Program Directors for Internal Medicine, also taking the time out to join us, and all our faculty here, and of course, residents. Um, if the panel is okay, as many as can, um, maybe stay for a few minutes afterwards if you have some lingering questions for them. Otherwise, you're, uh, you're released. Thank you very much. I just want to thank Kiki. Yes. Perfect. I want to thank oh, you oh, for doing this. <laughs> this is so important. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't all be here if you hadn't got together. Thank you guys for coming. Nice work. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good to see you. How are you doing? <laughs>